if you have witnessed it with your own eyes, and many of us in this room have, the process by which a caterpillar changes into a butterfly is probably among the most mundane and miraculous transformations that we can witness in the natural world. It's not especially rare, of course, but no matter how commonplace it may be, once you've seen it, you won't forget what it looks like. Watching what was once a soft, sluggish caterpillar emerge into its new life as a brightly colored, graceful and delicate butterfly floating weightlessly on the breeze, it seems like a bona fide miracle, no matter how many times we see it happen. And nothing about the anatomy or the physical structure of the caterpillar provides any hint at all about the appearance of the butterfly it will become. And if we could somehow peek inside the chrysalis while the transformation is taking place, we'd be even more astonished. After wrapping itself snugly inside its cocoon, the caterpillar's body begins to physically break down. During the weeks that it spends metamorphosizing, the cells of its body basically liquefy, becoming little more than an undifferentiated, protein-rich sludge. The gut and the musculature and the brain of the caterpillar degrade and dissolve in preparation for their radical redesign in service of a completely new kind of life, one lived by a creature who is no longer required to walk ploddingly along leaves but fly gracefully on the wind. Nothing about the adult butterfly resembles the formless goo inside the cocoon, which itself bears no resemblance to the caterpillar it once was. Some years ago, scientists began testing a hypothesis about whether the adult butterfly could retain any of the experiences it had had at a as a caterpillar. So they conducted an experiment in which they took a group of caterpillars and exposed them to a strong, volatile smell. Immediately after exposing them to the smell, the scientists subjected the caterpillars to a series of uncomfortable electric shocks. The scientists then let those caterpillars spin their cocoons, and when they emerged, the scientists exposed the butterflies to the same volatile smell. To their surprise, they saw that the butterflies became agitated and moved energetically away from the odor. In anticipation, presumably, of the painful shock they assumed would soon follow. So the conclusion that the scientists came to was that the butterflies seemed to have retained memories of painful stimuli that they experienced when they were caterpillars, even though their brains and bodies disintegrated nearly completely in the cocoons. The butterflies still somehow held on to those memories, storing them, perhaps not in their brains, but somewhere in the deep root structure of the cells of their bodies. It's a strange concept to contemplate that memories aren't an expression of our thoughts, but instead a sort of residue stored in our bodies. It's an idea that has made its way into a number of popular science books in recent years. There's a best-selling entry on the reading lists about psychology and trauma that came out about 10 years ago called The Body Keeps the Score by a Dutch-born psychiatrist named Bessel van der Kolk. In his book, the psychiatrist advances his theory that traumatic experiences, war or abuse, violence or pain can somehow make their way into the concrete physiology of the human body. Van der Kolk's contention, which is not, I should say, without critique in the scientific literature, holds that traumatic experience lodges somehow in the gut or musculature, in the endocrine system or in the brain chemistry of a human being, just like the remembered pain of those electric shocks for the butterflies in the lab. According to his theory, the human body becomes a living logbook, a permanent record of our lives' most painful and degrading experiences. And before we can hope to move forward in healing or wholeness, that trauma needs to be deliberately and properly metabolized, so to speak. Now, the research is still continuing, and 
New conclusions continue to emerge on this topic. One of the more interesting offshoots of this work was a, a book entitled, It Didn't Start With You, which proposes the idea that not only do our individual experiences with pain and trauma lodge themselves metastatically throughout our bodies, but that they can be passed on hereditarily from one generation to the next and the next. The research behind this notion suggests that people or communities who have been subject to significant and painful experiences of trauma can see physiological evidence of those hurts perpetuated genetically through multiple generations of their offspring. The Jewish community, not surprisingly, is frequently cited in studies of this sort where questions are continually explored about whether or not the bodies and brains of Jews who are alive today still bear the marks of the deepest suffering and oppression suffered by our ancestors. Whether or not the concepts turn out to have been scientifically reliable, whether or, whether or not we can verify these findings in laboratories, something about them still somehow feels true. We sense somehow that our grandparents' pain is our own, that the terror and trauma experienced by those who came before us is something we can feel like a pricking in our thumbs. There's something that we feel in the gut about fear and peril and the fruitless hunt for escape. It's like Marge Piercy says in her poem, Magid, we Jews are the people born of wanderers with shoes under our pillows. Jewish trauma certainly feels like something many of us carry in our DNA, right next to the genes for curly hair and lactose intolerance. But what I want to offer you tonight, friends, is a different sort of suggestion, the gentle and encouraging suggestion that if it is true that we can carry our predecessor's pain in our cells and in our genes, might it not also, might it not also be true that we can carry their joy and their most buoyant memories of redemption as well? This Shabbos, we read the story of the parting of the Red Sea and our ancestors' deliverance from Egyptian slavery. This portion retells the most dramatic climax of the Israelites' national biography when they were saved from certain destruction by the mighty hand and outstretched arm of God who parted the great sea so masses of former slaves could walk through the parted waters to freedom and independence. We call this Shabbat Shira, the Sabbath of song, a remembrance of the joy that our ancestors felt at having been saved from suffering so overwhelming that they could do nothing except break out in lively song and dance. The ancient rabbis were moved strongly by the drama of this scene, but they were also nagged at by persistent questions. What did the Song of the Sea sound like? Who taught it to the Israelites and when? How was it that a ragtag group of exhausted, malnourished slaves could muster the energy to sing and somehow find the time to learn a new song? How was it that the Torah seems to describe the Israelites as having sung that song in unison, their voices blending in perfect harmony and keeping perfect time? Well, there's a touching and a charming midrash that answers some of these questions beautifully, and I want to share it with you tonight. According to the midrash, Rabbi Yehuda asked his students, who was it that did all that singing, and how did they find the inspiration to say nothing of the expertise to sing to God so effortlessly with a unified voice of praise? And the rabbi answers his own question. The ones who led the singing were the young people, those who had been the babies that Pharaoh commanded to be thrown into the Nile when he first rose to power. You see, Rabbi Yehuda explained, at the beginning of the Israelites' servitude, when Pharaoh's cruel decree was issued to the Jews, whenever an expectant Jewish woman came near to the hour when she'd give birth, she would go out to the corner of some anonymous field and deliver her baby in secret. Shortly after the babies were born, the rabbi went on, the mothers would be forced to abandon them, leaving them tearfully in the hands of God. 
saying, Ribono Shalolam, ruler of the universe, I have done my part for them, now you do yours. And so Rabbi Yehuda continued, when those Israelites fled Egypt, and when they arrived at the shores of the sea, those young people, those babies had grown into, beheld God's presence at the parted water, and they recognized God as the one who had saved them all those years ago. And in their exuberant joy, they exclaimed as one, O oh God, you are the one who did those things for us when we were slaves in Egypt. I love this Midrash because of what it tells us about the nature of Jewish memory, what it tells us about the nature and the quality of Jewish joy. I love what it reminds us of, about what it's like to feel the nearness of God in our lives as a reassuring presence that can rescue us from some of our most difficult experiences. I love how it reminds us that we inherit so much more from the generations who came before us than just their trauma. This story enriches the Torah's account about the chorus of voices singing at the moment of Israel's greatest redemption by suggesting that that song was sung by a clamoring of souls bursting with happiness from memories they had all but forgotten. And I love this story because it's true. Because I know that all of us alive today are also receptacles of memory. We, all of us, are living storehouses of legacy and tradition and our ancestors' joyous, stubborn survival. We are their greatest dreams come true. We are the babies grown to children, grown to adults, grown to leaders. We are hope that gives way to doubt, which gives way to hope again. To be a part of this magnificent eternal peoplehood means to have inherited our great-great-grandparents' histories of living with shoes under their pillows. But it also means having received their courage their resolve to step forward into the dark, wet sand of the great forbidding seabed. It means living with the will to swallow hard and take one halting step and then another, with walls of water shimmering and thundering on our left and our right, and to keep walking. To be one of us means to walk toward the promise of a promise, and all the while to sing. We sing the song, friends, of newly opened eyes. We sing the song of every life awestruck with joy as for the very first time we unfurl our extravagant wings and take flight toward freedom. Shabbat shalom, everybody.